composed of people with iron stamina um, <laughs> who are plow right through. Um, let's come to order at 601. And um, before I turn proceedings over to Flora Diaz Smith as our master of ceremonies, I just wanted to remind everybody who is here. First of all, thank you so much for joining us for this. Um, for the uh, just the Zoom technicalities, uh, if everybody could please mute if you're not talking. And if there's anybody who is joining by phone, um, there doesn't appear to be anybody joining by phone. So I can leave off that part. Um, so anyway, Flora, shall I turn it over to you? Sure. Yeah, thank you, Scott. And so welcome to our community budget forum of tonight, December 2nd. Uh, I would like to start uh, first with the spirit of gratitude in because of the holidays. And I would like just to thank our amazing Washington Central Unified Union School District uh, team. So administrators, teachers, staff, cooks, custodians, bus drivers, Thank you for continuing to be the heart of our communities and thank you for all you're doing for our children during these challenging times. Uh, we know that it's not easy and your efforts do not go unnoticed. We all are very grateful. Uh, this pandemic has brought into focus public attention to children and education and the inequities in our society are known on every community member's mind. Food insecurity, limited mental health, access, healthcare, homeless, in as a broadband income inequality. Uh, so hopefully as a state and as a country, we are gonna prioritize community and common good. And that would be the, you know, the basic focus of the, for all of us, the well-being of all our children. So with that in mind, uh, we are gonna get started with our budget presentation and I'll just make sure that Jim has the budget presentation in uh, this is the first draft for our, level of, for our level service budget. And as a school board, we have the role of making decisions on behalf of our entire community that affect the education of each of our students. Engaging our communities in the conversation helps us make sure that the community voice is at the heart of our decisions. And it helps us to ensure that we're not only working towards equity in our schools, but also in our communities as a whole. For budget purposes today, uh, there you are. So uh, can you move it to the pictures? <laughs> the sure. first picture, uh, Jim? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. The... Oh, there you go, sort of. Okay, there we go. So uh, equity is, is uh, it's a school culture for us. It's a school culture that supports educators in practicing effective and responsive instruction, and responsive instruction that meets the needs of the whole child. For example, everybody is getting what they need in order to master our student outcomes. So as we move forward, a third slide, Jim, if we could move forward. So. Our student learning outcomes that you see here in our screen, and in case there's somebody on the phone, I can go over what, it, what they are quickly. So the student learning outcomes are statements that specify what students will know and will be able to do or be able to demonstrate uh, when they have completed or participated in a program or an activity. Uh, so these outcomes are, are usually expressed as knowledge, skills, attitudes, or values are, and are in alignment with the Vermont educational quality standards. And then to the right, so those are literacy, math content practices, global citizenship, scientific inquiry, content, knowledge, physical education and health, artist, artistic expression, and financial literacy. To the right, you see the transferable skills. And as we were coming out of our quality committee uh, and Jen was talking to us, you know, that's something, uh, transfer skills are at the heart of what we do. And they're basically, and, and right now they're being really the focus of our, of our teachers and it's, it's they're really important. So as a board, we have the responsibility to lead and make sure that we remove barriers and provide the resources needed so that we can set a, so that we can provide this education to our kids. So as a board, if we move to the next slide, um, 
Jim, please. It, as a board, we have said, uh, we had a retreat this summer and we set three goals. So those are improving student achievement, building a board governance and community engagement. These goals help us stay focused on student learning, on collaboration and on monitoring our, the results. I, I do hope that the financial forces that are probably coming to us in the coming year won't decimate the education of our kids, but transform it. So with that in mind, it, there's some celebrations as we get started. So we were one of five districts in Vermont to reopen fully for live in-person instruction from grades from pre-K to eight. We created more robust and community-centered remote learning offerings for all our students. Working, we have been working to align our instructional approaches for teaching math and literacy and provide all students with increased access to technology. Working to develop our own personal care assistance and behavior interventionist. School board is our school board is committed to the strategic planning process for continuous improvement plan and the creation of assessments plan to track students' academic process. With that in mind, I'm going to pass it on to Scott Thompson. Thank you very much, Blair. Um, so this slide, as you can see, um, is a, a visual picture of what it's like to put a budget together. Now, the um, stressing and straining and groaning and grimacing are absolutely true to life. What's not so true to life is what looks like, you know, the budget as a monolith from Stonehenge. Um, I think it would be, it would work better um, if we had a fire breathing dragon that all those little guys were trying to wrangle. But, um, but we're a public school district, so we don't have a graphics team. Um, so we have to make it into a rectangle and have you rely on your imaginations. What the words around it indicate, those are all the various dimensions that we have to work with. And those are only a few of them. Um, there are in fact many more. So that this is um, in sum a very complicated and difficult and necessary uh, process to find an equilibrium here with all of the different competing pressures and needs. Thank you. Next slide, please, Jim. Now, um, this slide makes the whole process look so efficient and machine-like. What we really need here are some of those little guys um, yelling at each other and making sausage in the background. The basic thing to remember here is that the draft budgets come from the, the people who work for us, from the superintendent, the business administrator, the leadership team, and basically everybody in the school district with whom they consult. And they pull all this stuff together and deliver to us on the board a draft budget. And then we do our thing with it. And as is happening, even on this occasion, send it back with additional guidance and keep on going until we finally feel as though we have something that will, that will stick, that will work for our schools, work for our people, and that something that, um, that will especially stand up at the ballot box and get approved. Um, thank you, next, Jim. Right, this is the, this is the droopy demographic chart. Uh, on the left, student enrollment, as you can see, dipping from 1600 for, well, looking six years into the past from um, the year after this. Um, and then the chart of equalized pupils. The thing to bear in mind here is both are going down, but lucky for us, equalized pupils are going down less. Now, equalized pupils are a weighted number um, based on the number, the student enrollment, but different ages of students and um, you know, poverty, other factors are, are weighed differently. So um, 
we haven't declined as far in equalized pupils, which is a good thing because equalized pupils is part of the tax formula. And the more we decline with equalized pupils, the higher the, the value of the fraction that determines our tax rate. So um, we're hoping to keep that, that line as, as flat as we can and at best increase it. And I think that does it for me and I pass on to Kari at this point, I do believe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Kari Bradley from Calis here. Thanks for being with us. So this um, um, slide shows some of the highlights from um, the context of the budget that we're um, putting together. Um, Scott talked about the declining enrollment picture, what um, we're seeing a, a steep drop this year. And what's not clear is, um, is that going to be temporary? Is there going to be a bounce back? Or is this part of a longer term trend? Also want to um, highlight that we we do have an excellent administration, faculty, and staff. So the people that work for the uh, school system, we feel very good about. Uh, of course, a dynamic stu student body, and um, have worked very hard to provide a variety of uh, different educational opportunities. So next slide, please. So I'm going to um, share some of the specifics about our budget, as at least where it stands. Currently, this bar chart compares the district's expense budget for the current year with our versions for next year. So far, we only have had two drafts. Draft one was a level service budget where we asked the administrators to project what would be the expense increase if we provide the same programs and same staffing levels as the current year, no changes at all. Uh, and then draft 1A is the same as the uh, level service budget, but with an adjustment for repairs and building maintenance expenses. And I'll get back to that in a couple minutes. But um, just know that we're planning on adding to this, uh, to this table, to this graph and show um, um, at other versions, other drafts. So the next time you see this, we'll have added more to it. And one other thing I want to um, ask you to keep in mind that um, our expense budget is really only one of the factors that will ultimately impact our next year's tax rate. There's also the student count. We've talked about that a little bit. There's the common level of appraisal for each of the towns. And there's the state's contribution that's set by the legislature in the spring. So we could have a lengthy discussion about any of those factors. Um, and we don't yet have all the information about those. Um, our operational expenses are the one factor that we have direct control over. And so that's gonna be our focus tonight. All right, next slide, please. Next slide is um, a couple pie charts that show the breakdown of our expenses by major categories for the current year and then the next year's budget. Is that coming through? That looks a little, okay, there you go. Um, so one of the clear takeaways here is that the personnel expense, that is the wages and salaries and the benefits of our teachers, support staff, administrators, that really makes up the lion's share of our budget, about 70% or more. Otherwise, uh, we're really only seeing relatively minor changes between um, uh, the, in the anticipated uh, relative proportions based on um, this year and our budget 1A at this point. Next slide, please. So now we're in. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. I have I have poor internet. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing my video, and maybe that'll help things. Give me a moment here. So I'm going to just start over. I might you might have heard me say that. Um, where are we? Um, so this uh, this um, slide is um, we're going to start looking at some of the um, items from next year, the budget draft that most significantly impact the bottom line. Um, these are only the highlights, so the numbers here are not going to necessarily add up, but we want to just have you focus on the things that matter most at this stage. 
So draft 1A has a net impact um, on taxes of a 3.7% increase over the current year. And you can see in that first section that a large portion of that is accounted for by increases in salaries and benefits for employees. At this point, we're estimating some of the components of the compensation since those will need to be negotiated. Um, and we do know that medical insurance will increase nearly 10% next year since that is something that's negotiated statewide now. Um, and then further on, we're showing some savings due to staffing changes, including some early retirements, but those will largely be offset by increased expenses due to federal requirements associated with a pandemic. Moving into the non-salary items, um, we're showing very little change from this section overall, but I do want to highlight that there is a significant increase for facilities maintenance in this section. Our current year's budget doesn't actually include the full allocation for building maintenance and, um, and repair. And so uh, we'll need to increase that um, in order to bring it up to a sustainable level. And then in the last section um, under revenues, you'll see that um, we are projecting about a half percent reduction in the revenue that comes from tuition that we receive from students who are uh, coming from other towns to attend our schools. Uh, for many years, we've benefited from students um, mainly coming from Washington, Orange and Roxbury, primarily attending U32. They, they have historically contributed a significant amount of revenue into our system. Uh, we're seeing a decline in the number of those students, and we're going to need to closely monitor that trend um, as it's um, a significant factor, adding a lot of pressure to our budget overall. So that's really the summary at this point. Um, remember that we're looking at uh, still a first draft of our expense budget. It's currently showing a tax impact of um, about 3.7%, and that's assuming a level service, no changes. We are expecting in the next drafts that um, we're gonna be incorporating some changes in programming and staffing. And um, at this point, we wanna start hearing from you, um, get your perspective so that we are ready to shape those changes as we move through this process. Also remember um, that there are expenses are just one of the several key factors uh, that ultimately determine the, the tax rate. So next slide, please. Um, and so to, to start out the conversation, we have some questions to help frame it up. And um, as we move into the dis discussion portion of the evening, we're gonna have you um, start by considering these three questions. First of all, what clarifying questions do you have for us? Um, what, what's not clear to you at this point? What's your reaction? Uh, what are your reactions to this information? And then are we doing a good job of properly balancing the budget in impacts on our students, our schools and our taxpayers? So those are our questions. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Floor um, to talk about how we proceed from here. Yeah, thanks Gary. Uh, so as we move along with the, the uh, can you put back the questions up uh, Jim, just for a second to give a chance to everybody to take a picture with your phone of the of the questions. If you have a phone near you, take a, take a picture of the of the questions so that the hope is to move into smaller rooms to have a, a, a conversation and talk about those three questions and then come out of those smaller rooms in 20 minutes and debrief as a big as a as a big group. It, Seems like we have enough people in attendance. Is that correct? I can't quite see everybody with the. Is that correct, Jim? Sorry to put you on the spot. Sorry, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. I was on mute. Sorry about that. Yeah, it does look like we have enough people uh, from uh, from the community here. And so, what I'd like to do is divide it up so we have um, a board member or two in each of the breakout rooms. I think we'll do. Based on 40 people total, we'll do uh, five breakout rooms of eight people, yep. is my thought. Um, yep. And uh, I'll, I'll try to put one or two board members uh, into each of those rooms, and then I'll ask that the board member uh, help scribe, um, you know, some of the feedback that we're receiving from 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 the from the uh, from the constituents. Thank you, Jim. 
So when we're ready, what I'll do is I'll stop sharing, and then um, I can put us in the groups. So uh, four, do you feel like we're in a good spot to we, do that? Yeah, we, we're we're ready. We're right on the schedule. We're on one minute past schedule. Okay, excellent. I'm going to go ahead and start that process right now. Just give me one minute to uh, to get organized here, and we'll Great. get that going. Thank you. Thank you. So I feel free to uh, to continue um, any sort of briefing while while Jim works. If there's anything <laughs> you want to get across. Yeah. No. I, if any other board member has something to share, you know, we all participated in the in the drafting the budget. Or if Lori has something to share, or Brian would like to share something. Well, it, with everybody, while we go into the rooms, I think I've talked enough tonight. <laughs> You're good. Any? I, I just I just think it's great that we're having a community participation tonight to talk about the budget and uh, our future. And just to let also know that the budget is what represents and should represent what the community values here in its schools. Uh, so, and, and I know I don't want to, I, I think Flora and Scott, you both uh, <laughs> said, and Kari had great, uh, you had great uh, a great presentation tonight. So uh, thank you. and. Uh, Brian, Again, this is if, if I could ask one thing, if I could, can you do me a favor and switch hosting uh, responsibilities over to me? I believe I'm in the co-host role, so it's uh, it's not letting me assign the breakouts. If that's okay. Our technology glitches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jim. For your Absolutely. Yep. Th thank you all. I appreciate your patience. So the, the, the idea is that these rooms will, you know, give you a chance to have smaller and uh, be able to give more, more input. So just remind the board members that would be in those rooms to take notes. And, uh, and then we'll debrief when we come, when we come out of the. Uh, Excellent. The and, and Brian, just for your benefit, uh, there is, if you go to the participants uh, icon at the bottom of your screen and then right click on the WCC USD um thing and then you should be able to make a host all right fantastic all right so now let me start working on my breakouts <laughs> scott do you have a story to share with us i see that you're no stories it, it's just um i think Part of the reason why we're doing the breakout rooms is exactly this, that it's so difficult to have any kind of regular conversation on Zoom um, when there are more than say five people or so. Um, it just, it, it has to be very programmatic, very linear, um, one at a time. It's, it reminds me of, you know, um, telegraphy in the old days where, you know, um, but, but at the same time, I'm not complaining. This is so much better than trying to, um, trying to do a conference call or trying to meet outdoors with six feet in between us all and masked, so. Okay, we're almost set everybody. We're very close here. Okay, you're in the countdown. Um, no, no taken. And he doesn't mean you personally, Stephen. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's, it's fine. And, and, uh, you know, the, the debt is, 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 and remains, um, um, some unresolved work. I, I think that's a fair way to say it. And there's, um, I, I'm, I, I don't have any specifics to share, but I think it is something that's been, in all the board, in like our retreat and in meetings where we're not um, overwhelmed with the minutia of, you know, the agenda and things that we need to do, um, that comes up and what possibilities there are. I, I, I have no problem with people expressing concern and dissatisfaction with that. That's 
we're here to hear whatever you have to say. And um, I, I don't take it personal, right? so that's fine. Great, that's great. Um, I noticed we probably have about four minutes, but I'd like to give an opportunity to my other colleague on the board, Towns, um, in case you have any questions for Mac and, and Cindy Towns. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I have, you know, um, uh, questions. You know, as someone who I don't pay taxes, um, <laughs> I, I barely understand how it works and how specifically how school property tax works. <laughs> you do pay taxes. You pay sales tax. Yes. Yeah, so no, I, I pay sales taxes. Um, I do not pay. I do not pay property taxes. Um, and I, 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 it is good to hear, I guess, that um, the effects that our decisions are having and um, also the ways that uh, they impact not just the students, but also everyone living in our district and in all of our towns. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm always glad to hear that perspective um, because as a student that's not a perspective that I hear often um, so I don't know if I have any I have any questions for you but I, I do appreciate uh, you being here thank you Stephen I wanted to say that I appreciate your your hearing us and valuing our feelings but this, this issue has been going on and we've already paid our taxes for this year and I feel like it's just kind of being left by the wayside and we're soldiering on and trying to pay our taxes and people are selling their houses in town and it's not really getting resolved. And I don't really see anybody saying, oh, but we'll resolve it by such and such a date. It just seems like it's drifting along. Well, rudderless, I guess. Yeah, um, the only, there's only one thing that I can that I can say with any clarity and and Scott being here too in towns is the three of our voices will will carry that concern to the larger group um, and um, for future agenda items for getting it on discussion. Um, there'll be three of us carrying your voice forward to the larger group. Um, I mean, that's really all I can, I can tell you with any assurance um, in, in this particular gathering at this time. I mean, I'm not, I'm less involved than I was uh, years previously, but um, from my understanding as of currently, there, there aren't any available resolutions that I'm aware of. Scott may be aware of some that I'm not, um, but that doesn't mean we don't continue to work to try to find some. Scott? Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, um, Stephen is a man of his word. So um, you can be sure that, you know, it will be carried not only on this occasion, but into the future. Um, he has the memory of an elephant, this man. Um, and I'm glad I can't see him on his screen. Um, so he's, I can't see him actually shooting um, darts in. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. OK. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, there, there may be some things that we can do that won't, that won't that, that can't actually change the amount that that um, callous taxpayers pay, but that may at least be able to take account of the uh, uh, of uh, kind of give credit to callous school for those excess payments by callous taxpayers, so that in future uh, future capital needs of callous elementary school are. Um, sort of offset in some way by these internal credits. Um, that, that's the only, um, I've, I've racked my brains over this and that's really about the best I can, I can come up with at this point, given 
given the constraints that we that we have. I know you have, and I appreciate you folks working on it. I know it's a thorny question, and I feel like the state kind of thrust it down upon the towns to sort out, and it's really not fair. But I do know people who are selling their houses because the taxes are too high, and they're moving away. I know of at least a couple of instances of that in our neighborhood. Um, and I think, you know, the other option is just to, you know, uh, let's break the elementary schools back out. I mean, uh, you know, let's, I want my elementary school back without the debt. You know, it's, uh, I, I think, you know, you know, push comes to shove. We, we should, we shouldn't have to be paying, paying these taxes and we should leave the union. Let's get out. Let's stop paying these extra taxes for debt we didn't vote for. Yeah, I, I hear you, Mac. Um, I, I, at this point, I think, um, it's just not like them. Right. Um, uh, by the way, 649, I note that we're going to be uh, uh, teleported back in the big room. So, um, before I to make sure that my were registered for, for all of you, for all of you being here. If you can hear me, um, if you, we're able to hear through the instability of my internet connection. Um, I want to um, thank Tom's for being on the board as a student rep. That's good. Did you hear me? Yeah. I'm happy to do it. Thank you. <laughs> I guess he heard me. <laughs> yeah. So we can leave the breakout room now. We don't have to wait until it closes. All right. Bye. Can look at the last couple of slides. So if I could have a volunteer, I really can't see everybody because we have the big W in the middle. Oh, there we go. I see everybody now. Do we have a volunteer that would like to share from their group? Or should I just call on people? <laughs> Let's see. I can't tell who was in each group. So Scott, do you want to go? Sure, um, and I would ask Stephen Luke and Tans de Groot to um, to back me up in case I miss anything or get something wrong. Um, we had um, we had the Morses, Cindy and Mac, in our group, and um, the main concerns are cost. Um, an expression of appreciation and um, and at possibly at the way remote learning has been implemented and the way that the, um, the school has been able to keep operating. Um, some concern about the assessment plan for tracking academic progress. Is it a duplication of, M of the um, multi-tier system of supports or is it somehow competing with it, how is it working? Um, uh, expression of concern about perhaps the heavy um, presence of administrators. Is there too much administrative overhead? Um, people are, uh, are hurting in our towns. Some of them are taking pay cuts in order to keep their jobs. Um, the pain should be shared by, by all, including um, employees of the school district. And then finally, the, um, the problem of the debt, the, um, the pooling of, of pre-existing um, long-term debt and the debt service that goes with it um, that has led to a sharp rise in taxes in, um, in at least one of our towns. Did I miss anything, Towns or Stephen? I think that uh, was a very apt summary. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, Scott. So, uh, Kari? Um, so, I'm going to ask Jonas to share because he did the scribing, but um, there was one question that I was wanted to ask Lori.
I, I lost you, Kari, sorry. Uh, I think Kari was talking about the, um, the $400, $400,000. Kari, are you back? Yeah, I am. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Lori or Brian, would you mind explaining a little more about um, the, the, the need for new money for building repairs and maintenance um, in this year's budget and why, why that wasn't allocated in last year's? Yeah, I'll let Lori uh, talk about it. Uh, I, I, I it's my understanding that uh, it was something that it was it, the request came in after last year's budget cycle, but before this school year started. Is that correct, Lori? Um, what happened was at U32, particularly, um, we used a budget in a capital fund transfer money that is now being considered by the state as repairs and maintenance and not capital. And so last year during the budget process, we had the conversation, but we didn't have ample time as a newly merged district to compile the needs of the school. So since that time, we've compiled the needs. Um, we are still revisiting the list to see if it's more of a multi-year initiative instead of a single year impact on the budget. And so when we do the next budget draft, we're, we're looking at that list more thoroughly and we're gonna be making a revised recommendation um, for the board. Okay, thank you, Lori. Okay. So jo Jonas, do you want to share a couple of the um, points that were made in our group? Just one second. Someone's upset. Give me just 30 seconds. Floor, maybe go on to another group. So sweet. No, here he comes. Um, I'm, I'm back. He can help Sorry. you. <laughs> um, so we talked about how the uh, 2021 enrollment projection got calculated. Um, and you know the, all of the uh, you know, the, uh, the legwork that went into putting that together, including uh, you know reaching out to homeschool families, you know, and seeing if anyone's going to come back. Um, we talked about uh, the issue that we just discussed. Um, uh, this this the slice of special ed from last year's budget to this uh, budget one A seemed to go down more than the other slices, sort of as a as a relative share. Um, and uh, uh, we want to call out uh, Kelly Bushy for doing an amazing job of working with the, um, uh, the, uh, the PCIs and the special ed folks uh, to try and realize cost savings there. Um, there was a question about how budgeting is done. Uh, is there a budget for each school and are those sort of just mashed together or is there one budget for the whole district? Um, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of both, but now, you know, since consolidation, there is one budget for the district. Um, but the principals uh, meet with Lori, meet with Brian to look at you know, each slice of the pie and how it fits into the larger picture. Um, uh, we briefly discussed the, that the, uh, you know, the projected 10% rise in medical insurance costs is frustrating. Uh, it's a driver for all budgets for all organizations. Um, um, and in talking about the balance between education and budget, uh, and, and taxpayers, um, um, uh, uh, someone was struck by uh, Front Porch Forum posts about the aging population paired with declining enrollment and calling into question whether or not we're thinking about all taxpayers. Um, we had a number of administrators in the group. Um, you know, so there was a comment that uh, uh, the piece of the budget that administrators you know, sort of control or have a say in is, is pretty small. Um, when it comes to bigger initiatives, that might take a larger slice of the pie. But if you know, the example was, if you get a math interventionist, that might have the biggest impact, but also might be the first to get cut. Um, uh, in the elementary schools, we're looking at right sizing uh, you know, in terms of equity. We looked at interventions la interventionists last year to make sure they were equally distributed. This year, we're looking at allied arts, having some of those hard conversations. Um, um, you know, you can't just get rid of a math teacher in the high school when the student count goes down because you still need a math teacher. Um, thinking about uh, programming from pre-K to graduation, uh, you know, what's the two or three or five year plan? Um, you know, there's a, you know, somewhat of a lack of alignment um, and that has some budget implications, but we're starting to think about that now. Um, and, um, and, and working in the right direction and then that's, I, I, Group five, have I summarized that accurately? Thank you. Sorry, which group am I missing? Is the, can somebody volunteer besides my group? 
with Jael? I can call on uh, Casey. I know we had a group, uh, so maybe Casey took, I think Casey took the notes from our group. Sure. Um, we had a nice discussion. We were, um, we had four administrators and a staff member and a community member. So it was um, a great discussion, but um, some things that we talked about how, some questions around uh, the expected increases, decreases, uh, a little, a bit of a discussion around how we were mostly looking at the level service budget and that um, the next round um, will, when we have more parameters from the board, we may have to make some tough decisions and make recommendations to the board around what, what we're thinking there. Also discussions around um, in light of the pandemic, how that will likely impact um, the budget going forward. Uh, considering the needs of students and uh, the tightening of the financial financial strains and how uh, we recognize that uh, over the past year with the being forced to switch to remote learning in the spring had some implications on our students um, and how we always want to focus on the needs of students and the concern about how the potential for cutting any resources uh, would have negative implications but um, we're all focused on what, what our students need and, and respecting our taxpayers and keeping things in mind. And, and can I just add on to that? Uh, and uh, there was a, a, a good dialogue about, uh, is this the best time to have a level service budget uh, given that folks are hurting? And, uh, the, and then it was the other side of it, the other side of that coin was, our children have had missed a lot of learning from last due to the pandemic from last year. And it just doesn't feel uh, appropriate to do anything uh, to, to, to really cut uh, our budget uh, because we our kids need education more so than ever before as a result of this pandemic. Thank you, Casey and Brian. Okay, so I, th I think we had the last group. Lori, you wanna yeah. share? Yes. So we had three board members, uh, two administrators, then a grad student who was doing, I think, research on school budgeting. Um, the three topics we had come up with were um, that the two-year equalized pupils on the chart had not projected for FY22, and that that will be um, updated for the next um, board meeting. Uh, the other piece was with regard to essential workers and whether or not our staff would qualify for some type of a care support. Um, my answer was that most of our employees would be making more than the $25 an hour who work in our child care. Um, that was one criteria. The second was some of the funding was also not eligible for schools because we're an arm of the government. So um, we have more information about CARES and COVID reimbursement that will come in January. And then the last thing was with regard to the letter that came out today, um, from the tax commissioner and we are keeping an eye on that and we'll have a lot of information to share with the board um, with regard to that with the next budget draft sorry i think that was it i had just one more we talked a little bit that uh, similar to what the other group was saying that if figuring out where our kids are and wh what their needs are going to be so it, it feels like this administrators has spent a lot of time uh, restructuring what they have that was one comment that we had. And then the other question was, uh, what, what does it mean to lose a choice uh, student? And Lori shares about $21,000 uh, uh, per student, right? That is for a tuition student. For tuition, the word yeah. Choice, choice means something else. So yeah, choice sorry. is usually so free, tuition tuition. For, yeah. for, yeah, for ninth grade up. Yeah. Uh, so that, any other, questions that came up that well so our group oh, didn't share so chris chris was our yeah. reporter yeah, yeah. Um, um, and you know what i was on mute i was anyway yeah i was on mute um so we had a we had a the three board members and uh, two community members uh and had a good conversation one of the questions that we have for lori um is whether the nine percent nine cent increase that the um is being proposed, uh, what impact that has on the 3.7% um, budget increase that we're looking at now. Um, and so, Laura, if you could just address that, and then I'll go on to report after we hear your answer, if you have the answer. So 
So I was planning to run multiple scenarios for the next budget meeting. We've been making huge strides in the budget process and working toward coming up with a draft that is below the target that the board gave us. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're aware of the tax impacts and we're planning to meet on Tuesday as a group to address this. And so I would like to defer my response completely until after that meeting, if possible. Okay, uh, so you report out next board meeting? Yes. Okay, it'll great. be Thank part you. of the budget packet. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so the um, we had a good discussion and um, my sense of the uh, focus was that we um, wanted a budget that would meet the needs of um, our students and our community members. Uh, and that uh, given the impact of the um, COVID pandemic now, uh, that there was not much support for actually reducing um, teaching staff or services to students who I think the sense was that students may already be behind uh, and need extra support going forward. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think that that's where the, the consensus was is that we'd be um, looking favorably on maintaining uh, the current levels um, and prioritizing um, keeping intact the services that our students need and that the community needs um, to weather this pandemic storm. And if anyone in the group thinks I've, I've misstated or didn't emphasize, emphasize something enough, please speak out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for participating in that round of questions. We're gonna move, Jim, if you have the slide presentation available to the last two slides. Next one, please. And so the next steps or that you're aware is, this was draft 1A, as we talked about, leverage service uh, budget. It, our administrators will put a list of what is not included in the level service budget and the board has provided feedback uh, and, and set parameters in November uh, on November 18th. So now the school board is gonna meet again and look at draft two in December from December 16th. And we will have a budget a draft, a, we will have to have a budget draft is on January 6th and try to finalize our January, uh, the, the final budget by January 13th, sorry. But we are planning on more community feedback. It, it, we had this one on December 2nd and then we'll have one on January 13th. We are also, after this slide, there will be a slide with all the names of the board members, which are familiar and are also in the website. So please feel free to email any of us if you have any questions or any input that you think about it after leaving this meeting tonight. Um, and then we'll have some informational uh, meet, uh, community meetings, no, 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 mo no more feedback because by that point we would have had to have a final uh, budget, uh, February 17 and March 1st, and then our first pandemic town meeting March 2nd. <laughs> and that sort of concludes our presentation for today. I want to thank again Lori and Brian and all of the leadership team for all their work. It, this doesn't happen on its own. And here's the list of all your board members. And feel free to reach to us. And that concludes our meeting for tonight, for this part of the meeting tonight, <laughs> at least. And I'll pass uh, this on to Scott. Thank you so much, Fleur. Um, and amen to those thanks to all who helped put it together. And if I might just add our thanks to members of the public who have sacrificed perhaps the best part of your Wednesday evening um, to join us for this. Um, now you know us, so please don't hesitate to stay in touch. Um, Fleur just showed you the list. Uh, we're at your disposal and are um, are more than more than happy to field your questions, and if we can't answer them, then we'll uh, we'll try to find out how. And if they can't be answered, we'll just wrestle with them um, and see who comes out on top in the end. 
Uh, so, um, before we uh, before we continue, I mean, this is sort of the the end of a of a paragraph in the meeting. Why don't we take five if there's no objection, um, and come back for uh, for the rest of it at seven twelve p.m. Sound good? Scott, this is Steve. Can you hear me, Scott? Uh, yes, I can. Just I, it has nothing to do with the, the board or the community. Um, the slide that listed school board members, and maybe when we're listing school board members going forward, we should list the student members as well. I, I completely agree, Stephen. Um, I, I, I'm sorry for the oversight. You're no, absolutely I, right. No, I know you're not. You're not trying to make me feel bad. I know that, but it's. Um, I think it's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Um, I uh, yeah, I, I see at least one thumbs up. Um, Anna, do you want to be listed? I hope. Okay. Good. All right. Um, as everybody drifts yeah, back in. Dorothy? Forget about town. I didn't clearly hear what Stephen said. I'm sorry. Oh, he, um, Stephen quite rightly pointed out that the, um, the list of board members ought to include the student members. Yes, fine. Yeah, good. All right. So um, reception of guests. Uh, once again, anybody who is um, who has the fortitude to stay on from the budget community forum. Um, you're most welcome to stay with us. I'm very happy that you're hearing us anew. Welcome. Um, agenda revisions. I do have one, um, but I, I can save it if somebody else has one to propose first. Um, any, uh, Kari. Yeah, I just want to remind us that we agreed that we were going to do a little reflection at the end of each meeting. So that should really be a standing item. And uh, one other point while I have the floor is I would recommend putting the new board norms in the packet, maybe on page two of the packet, just to remind us of those. Good, good point. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Sounds great, Kai. And with that, you completely stole my thunder. So. So much for my agenda. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> totally okay. I'm always happy to have my thunder stolen. Um, anybody else uh, with an agenda revision? Okay. Um, I, I, I might just make one note that um, in keeping with what Kari mentioned a moment ago about board norms and in particular the reflection that we should try to stay on time and follow the um, of the time posts along the way. Um, you may notice that um, although the meeting is scheduled to last until nine, if we follow the time posts precisely, it will run until 924. So um, we'll, uh, we'll just sort of try to be brisk, practice mindful speaking in this case. Um, so shall we move on then? Um, if there are no other agenda revisions. Um, student reports. Towns and Anna. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. So some updates from the student community and all of that is um, during the week right around Thanksgiving, we were all virtual because of there were COVID cases. And on that week, we also, that was also the week of Thanksgiving. Um, so, you know, uh, we had the two, vir two virtual days, Monday and Tuesday, and then we launched into our Thanksgiving vi uh, vacation, Thanksgiving break um, for the other three days of the week. At the beginning of this week, when the middle school students and the freshmen and sophomores went back, there wasn't really much of a choice for the meal type, and there wasn't really um, pre-ordering allowed because they were just coming back and as well as that there is no late bus until further notice which can be kind of a bummer for some students that have to stay after. Um, the library has expanded some of its uh, virtual services um, including uh, giving students access to a program uh, 
uh, with um, uh, greater access to virtual books and virtual um, content. Um, let's see. So as of right now, and according to the state, winter sports have to be paused until further notice. So what is still going on though is stage 32 has a virtual performance they're going to be doing and they've been doing some rehearsal for that. Um, we, we did just have our Thanksgiving vacation, but the, hol um, the holiday vacation is coming up pretty, pretty soon, actually. Um, only, only a few weeks until uh, that. And um, another very important thing for juniors and seniors is we took the PSATs and SATs in October and we're getting our test results. Anna, um, I think we, uh, you froze on us. Um, uh, do you mind running that by us again, please? Can you hear me now? All right, perfect. I'm going to keep my camera off. I'm very sorry you can't see my face anymore, but I hope my, verse, my voice works. So in October, right around the 15th, the juniors and seniors took the PSATs, and ACTs, um, SATs, all of that, and we get our results back on the 8th. So that is very exciting. Um, is the tag team finished, or um, yeah. are you uh, next time? Unless you guys have some questions for us. Yeah, um, board member questions for Towns or Anna and or Anna. If, if I could just ask one, um, are, are you getting any sort of um, sense of student reaction to the um, to shutting down winter sports, at least until the end of December? I mean, you know, there are definitely students who um, are worried and disappointed um, uh, by this news. Um, and I, I Unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to, um, because of my three virtual weeks in a row, I haven't had the opportunity to interact with them <laughs> in maybe the proximity that in-person school would allow. But um, from the people I have talked to, there is definitely a sense of uh, disappointment. Yeah, I, um, I as well have been online for the past three weeks, which is very, very hard social wise. And I think having winter, I can predict that having winter sports was a really big social thing and being able to relieve stress. And because of the pandemic, it's really hard to even get outside and move around as much. So I feel like it will um, be a little bit harder for students in general. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm sure. Thank you very much for that. Um, if there are no other board member questions for Towns and Anna, we can move on to the superintendent's report and COVID update, I guess, up first. Brian, I think you're ready, right? Thank you, Towns. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I want to say that your first, Anna, you took a little bit of my thunder as well. I was going to talk about the U32 winter sports update, but uh, I appreciate you uh, talking about that. Uh, uh, and it's uh, very unfortunate. We're just waiting to hear back, uh, hear in additional information uh, from the uh, Governor Scott's office. Uh, and uh, we'll hopefully have a return uh, sometime in the near future. We're hoping, we're, we're, we'll be remain hopeful, but uh, uh, thanks for bringing it up. Welcome. And uh, I just want to, uh, say that you know, I hope everyone had a happy Thanksgiving. I know I uh, enjoyed, enjoyed it spending it with my wife, Ruth, and my daughter, Zadie. Uh, we were hoping to see some other folks, but uh, we did not. Uh, we uh, stayed uh, in, our, in, our, in our house uh, and uh, enjoyed each other's company for, for the uh, short time that we had. I was uh, also uh, happy that we 
didn't have too much time, too many uh, calls from the Department of Health over the Thanksgiving break. That was uh, a relief. Uh, it didn't mean that uh, we weren't talking. Uh, Elizabeth and I probably talked every day uh, about something, except on Thanksgiving. We gave each other the break on that on that day. Uh, but uh, and we also uh, were uh, were happy to uh, have U32 and Calus uh, reopened again after uh, having to uh, take some measures to keep everyone safe. And I, so I just wanted to uh, also thank the leadership team who uh, met with me over the weekend uh, pr uh, prior to when this all happened, because we have definitely had a lot of conversations about what was happening in our district uh, at the time, following uh, getting, re uh, getting reports from the Department of Health, uh, getting uh, reports uh, back from our sur surveillance testing uh, that we completed uh, prior to Thanksgiving break. We also just had surveillance testing round number two uh, this past this, uh, today, so uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm surprised Elizabeth isn't uh, slumped over in her chair sleeping right now. Uh, it's been a uh, a very um, what's the word a very busy time in the uh, the world of surveillance testing and uh, making sure we keep everyone safe. So I just want to thank uh, also want to thank the Calvis uh, principal uh, Cat. I want to thank Stephen and his administrative team at U32 uh, to be able to. Uh, drop a pivot on a moment's notice. And that's what we've been able to do. And uh, and I just wanna thank them for their leadership as well. Um, and also uh, I have to say, I, have to, I also have to say thanks to the Department of Health. I think they have their hands full with what's going on here in Vermont, but uh, they were also very helpful. Uh, I think they were also extremely helpful today. I don't know if Elizabeth wants to talk more about that part. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, we, we uh, were fortunate with the Department of Health helping us out uh, in particular uh, with our schools. I really am impressed. They, you yeah. know, I know that they're crazy busy and swamped, but um, we had an issue with uh, trying to get Callus open and some of the implications of that fiasco on Friday when people got tested and all those test results got lost. And it just fit in with our timeline that some people got test, didn't get their test results. So yesterday they stepped up, they it encouraged every one of those people who needed to do it to get tested yesterday. And they had our results by last night at like seven o'clock. And, um, and it was, it, it allowed Calus really to open. So we were really, I was really pleased. And plus I was pleased, I would have to say for the people who were affected, I said that to Kat, that um, Calus staff, I mean, they were so wanting to be in school today and for the rest of the week that they really, they went out, completely out of their way to make this happen. And uh, it really takes a lot of people to uh, work together. And I feel like we do work together really well. There's a lot of people who are pulling, their, pulling more than their weight. Can I just throw in some love there for Elizabeth? She's not gonna toot her own horn, but I will. She is amazing. Um, the, I was just about crying by Tuesday afternoon thinking, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to open on Wednesday. And that, that girl made the magic happen. We sent staff down to the, the parking lot in Barrie to get tested and we had results before they said we would. That is all to you, Elizabeth, so thank you. Not alone, but thanks, yes. I tried. <laughs> and uh, so thank you, Kat. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so the other thing is uh, just to report back, uh, the, uh, some folks may be wondering about how did holiday travel, what was going on in our schools, were people gonna come to school? There was all these questions that were happening. Are people gonna come to school? I have the uh, three-day attendance report for Monday, Tuesday, and today combined. And uh, it's our current attendance as for those three days total is 94.12%. Uh, so a large majority of our kids across the district are coming to school. Uh, Berlin had 94.08%. Callis had 95.83%, Doty had 92.81%, East Montpelier had 93.78%, our remote learning school, 96.8%, Rumney had 94.56%, and U32 Middle and High School, 93.76%. So uh, a majority of our, our, our students, teachers, families, everyone, uh, we're, our schools are open uh, and they're, 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 they continue uh, to, to remain open. And uh, again, if we have to make uh, decisions and tough decisions, we'll be prepared to do so. 
uh, but where I think our precautions and all the work that we've been working on uh, throughout the year, the entire system uh, from our communities, our students, our teachers, our ESP staff, uh, our leadership team, uh, board members, I think it's working right now. So, so that is uh, my uh, COVID report. Uh, just, uh, I don't know if you want any questions about the COVID report, or would you like me to continue? Yeah, let's, let's if we may, um, just pause at this mm -hmm. point and uh, let board members uh, ask questions if, if you have any before we move on. Uh, are there any questions from board members for Brian on his COVID update? Were related to, Brian, uh, I'm just to curious the from COVID the work? Point of view, um, because I haven't been very um, engaged and actually at school is COVID is being controlled and it's, it's going down is what you're saying? What I'm saying is that uh, in our schools, we're open. Uh, our students are and our staff are currently safe. We have not had any evidence of transmission in our schools, and that's why we're open. I, I, as of right now, from what I understand, if you look at the news, I believe around the state of Vermont, uh, it is not down. Uh, however, we've been very fortunate here in our schools uh, to remain open, and I think that's a testament to our the precautions that everyone has been taking and uh, what we've instituted since the beginning of the school year. Thank you for the clarification. Thanks. You're here. And, and it, it can sometimes feel like watching an entire school system cross a high wire um, without a safety net. But, um, but I guess there is a safety net. Um, and uh, it's, been working, it's been working remarkably well. Um, and it is a credit to, uh, to all of you. It does credit to all of you. Um, uh, other board member questions? Okay, then um, should we move on then, Brian, to projected student enrollment? Uh, yeah, just I, before I even get there, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, the other thing was, it's not related to COVID, but uh, just to uh, remind everyone that Calis will be going uh, remote December 7th, and this is for a non-COVID related item. It's to uh, get their ventilation uh, to do complete the ventilation project, which is scheduled to start on or around that time. Um, I don't know if Kat has anything else to uh, share. I know it's, it's, we were both like, oh no, we're going remote and we gotta go back in and we gotta go back to, but uh, I think we were happy to have everyone back in these last few days. Kat? Yeah. Um, it was um, awful to think about missing out this last week before, go, before our planned remote. Um, but I'm so impressed with the staff that have been working diligently to get prepared for our remote period um, that we pulled it off really well. And our families were, they rocked it. They were so flexible um, and it's hard. It's really hard to depend on everything that schools do and to have it change on a dime and, and then say, and we're gonna go back to <laughs> a remote, um, but uh, we got a lot of great work done with the contractors. They were able to get in a couple of jobs in early because we didn't have students in the building. And we got all of our devices deployed and uh, gave families a chance to practice to make sure all that work that we put into um, accessing a more robust remote instruction is working. So I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Uh, and uh, now I have the, uh, just to go over the, uh, the big uh, piece that is the, uh, that's a big part of, I know we had our budget meeting today, we talked about our declining student enrollment. I did uh, get an updated uh, NESDEC student projection report, uh, enrollment report, projected student enrollment report uh, for the current year. I did not have that at the last board meeting. Uh, it came in uh, right after our board meeting. So uh, I did update it. I did give you an updated letter in your board packet. Um, the, um, the results definitely say that the projected enrollment is still declining, uh, uh, over the time. One thing is we also, during that time, we had our principals, uh, do a lot of work on their end to look at tuition students, uh, reaching out to families, uh, across the, uh, uh, to identify our homeschool, talk to our homeschool families. Are you coming back to school? What's, what's happening? It seems that we were able to identify many families that do intend to have their children come back uh, 
as long as uh, you know we, we, everyone feels safe and this and, and uh, I think some folks, it's again it's a difficult conversation though because some folks are some some families are still reluctant to come back, but others are ready to come back. So it's been um, so we were able to project uh, additional students coming into our school. Um, there and then uh, one of the things we also looked into was this uh, NESDEC. Uh, data port report that we get every year. Uh, they give us uh, their projections. Well, this current injection, uh, current enrollment report had a discrepancy that we learned uh, on the historical side of their report. And uh, for the first time, uh, in, for the first time in the since getting this report over the last several years, I know that uh, the the board's been getting or the superintendents get these reports uh, every year. For the last several years, we found out that uh, from 2005 to 2014, uh, there was uh, they did not include uh, the they did not include the um, the tuition and exchange students in those reports. Uh, so ultimately, uh, we were uh, looking at that. I'm sorry, not I'm sorry, not 2005 to 2015. I'm sorry. I'm reading this wrong. 2010, 2011 school year to the 2019, 2020 school year, uh, the numbers were off on the historical projections because uh, they did not. The, the uh, NESDEC was not including tuition and exchange students. Uh, so there was uh, some numbers because we were looking at the numbers and we were wondering why they were very different than what we our census projections that we do every every year uh, on October 1st, and that's what we learned. So. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, this current school year aligns directly, the NESDEC report aligns directly with our enrollment projections uh, because we are now including the tuition and exchange students who also are in our uh, report. So just some little things, so if someone was uh, looking at those uh, projection reports, just wanted to make sure that uh, we were on top of that and we definitely looked into it. Uh, but ultimately, I'm not gonna go read through the whole report, it's in the board packet. It basically does say the one big thing at the end of uh, page 20 of your board packet uh, is October the census reports. And, uh, and this is important because we the budgets and the formulas is, is based on our two-year enrollment census. Uh, October 1st, 2019 census was 1,574 students. October 1st, 2020 census was 1,487 students. Uh, this year, uh, October 1st, uh, next, I'm sorry, projected uh, census for October 1st, 2021 is 1,455 students. So while it's not a major decline in students from October 1st, 2020 to October 1st, 2021, there still is a decline. Unfortunately, the two-year enrollment census is a decrease of 119 students over a two-year period. And so, uh, the ultimate piece here is I know we had the budget meeting here tonight. Um, I know Lori talked about um, additional uh, information coming from the state office today regarding taxes, uh, but we also have the second draft budget will also consider uh, this 119 student decline over the two year period. And uh, I don't know if uh, Lori wants to add anything else. If uh, Lori, if you want to, uh, or did I uh, cover that piece? At all, and I'm actually working on trying to project um, next year's equalized pupils for the tax formula. Um, we receive information on December 15th from the state, but I've been working with Brad James to try to put together what would that formula be because the legislature did um, change the formula in this coming year budget cycle. So um, at the next meeting, I look forward to having the opportunity to review all that information. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Brian. Um, I see that Diane has her hand up. So uh, just a couple questions. Um, one, just a clarifying one about um, how, how are we helped or impacted by hold, being held harmless for this um, census rate? Um, and so, and, and does that two-year average, is it part of a projection or does it go for these two years? I mean, do we use actual or is it the projection? And so, so that's one question. The, the other is, 
I know in several other um, roles that I play, we're really anticipating and beginning to see a COVID bump. So there's like this mini baby boom that's occurring. Um, and so it's just something to kind of uh, keep in mind um, too, as we're, you know, one of the three years down the road, we might end up with this incredible number that we have to house. So it's my understanding that the formula um, is unique this year. It would historically have used last year's, it's called average daily membership plus this year's average daily membership so, and divided it in half. What's unique about this year is the legislature changed that to be last year's average daily membership for both years. So what remains to be seen is what will happen next year because this year statewide people have expected a decline. So if you think about it, it's kind of like kicking the can down the road. If you've had a decline in students and you don't use it in the formula this year, what's gonna happen next year? So I can't answer next year yet. I think the legislature will take that up as they go forward. But for right now, that's um, trying to help schools in the state maintain their level of um, equalized pupils by keeping that two-year average to be reflective of pre-COVID information. And will that include, is that where the 119 decline is coming into play? It could come into play um, going forward significantly because you probably won't feel the full impact of that in this next budget cycle, but the one thereafter. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what okay. is the direct impact for, for this time and then mm -hmm. what is going down. Cause absolutely you can't kick the right. can down the road too far, but just mm -hmm. trying to understand what we know is our immediate impact and what we anticipate. Okay, I'll put together some slides for the next meeting if that's okay. Um, thank you. Yes, Thank you, Lori. Yeah, and sadly, Lori, you won't be here next year to present this to us. Um, any other board member uh, questions for Brian on the enrollment piece? I see none. Um, John? So, John? Oh, oh, um, wait a minute. I see one. Chris. Yeah. So, um, Brian, is there a sense as to why the dramatic difference in the decline between October 1 of 2019 and October 1 of 2020 outside of the COVID? I, I do not I do not know uh, why that's happened. Uh, I think there's been a larger population trend declining throughout the entire state. So I think that uh, uh, one may assume, but of course, you know what happens when you make assumptions. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't want to assume anything, but I would look, I, I believe that looking at the state data that I've received, it looks like throughout the state, this has been happening throughout uh, a population trend of students are going down, uh, student enrollment across the state. Uh, so I think we're part of a larger, we're part of a uh, the whole state of Vermont. And I think it's been, what's been happening here is also happening around all the districts. I can tell you, though, that the birth rate across the country has been declining. Uh, uh, for example, 2019, for example, I can tell you was one of the lowest uh, birth rates in the last 20 years. And the only reason I know that is because my daughter was born then. So that, that's uh, I, I, I didn't like look that up for tonight's board meeting, but I did. I do know that. So, so we can't blame you. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. He's a, as um, always, a, con a contrarian. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, both a blessing yeah, and a yeah. curse, Chris. <laughs> so. um, but is it great? So, can um, I just and, ask you? Can I have another clock? So these numbers is the one thousand uh, five hundred seventy-four and the one thousand four hundred eighty-seven. Are those equalized students that are um, protected by this formula, or are they real students? Or Students. They're yeah, they're real called, um, it's called a census, which is different than ADM. Okay, so those are real students then? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Good. Um, anyone else for, for Brian? If not, um, uh, unless, um, unless my memory is failing me, I think we're on to the finance committee portion and I'll recognize Flora. 
Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, we are just going to report briefly. We met on uh, just yesterday <laughs> at eight in the morning. Uh, and uh, the main topic for today, I would just want to make a motion. We had time to discuss, but I'll make a motion, Scott, and then we discuss. Is that how we want to do it? Yes. So I'll make a motion to approve uh, the curriculum, the bid for the Curriculum Management Solution Inc. CMSI for $36,250. And then we Very can- Very good. Um, yeah. Second. Who's moved? Kari has seconded. All right, discussion. Um, so I can share some of what we yeah I can share some of what we discussed in the in the meeting or if you guys had a chance to to read the memo from uh, from from Brian and and Lori but as you can see there were nine vendors and it was advertised in two papers and um, this uh, this bid in particularly uh, we are author we are recommending the full amount and it would depend on how much is done in person and how much is done remote but we wanted to give the, the team that flexibility. Uh, and Lori and Brian, and Brian, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a grant to pay for this. So don't get too stressed about the money after the conversation that we had talked. It still is money, I understand, but it's a really good thing. And uh, uh, we had, if you guys wanted to know numbers, we have some numbers of the other three people, the, the other three companies that it submitted a bid. This was the most comprehensive bid from from the three that we that that we received. So I think if you guys have questions, that would be best. Unless Brian, you want to share? I mean, I think you covered all the bases for. <laughs> so. So, questions. It, maybe, mm -hmm. oh, I'm just curious um, what kind of grant, like federal, local, what kind of grant is this money? It's a REAP grant. It's R-E-A-P. It's a federal grant. And, and Lori, if I'm not mistaken, the um, if we didn't use the money, it would have to go back to the feds. Is that correct? Right. We are coming, getting close, but we have to spend it this fiscal year. You're right. And it was unexpected money that we didn't have a plan for um, when we found out about it last spring. Um, uh, other other board member questions on this or um, concerns? Hi. Uh, oh, just, Dorothy. Just out of curiosity, um, are there any other school districts in Vermont who have used this company? I believe not recently, not in recent memory. Uh, th this is the uh, this company is one of the national national known uh, uh, curriculum review uh, places around. I think they were one of the ones that actually started the process back in like the 1970s. But so I think uh, I, if memory corrects me, I did ask that question, um, and uh, they uh, I was informed that I think it was West. Essex, maybe, uh, but this may have been 10 or 15, maybe 20 years ago. It was a while ago. Okay, Brian. Thanks. Um, Chris, did you have something? No, sorry. No, okay. Uh, Diane, though, yes. So I, I completely, you know, I, I did read through this because I wanted to have a better sense of it. Again, I, I have very strong concerns about us doing an audit at this time. I know that it's not um, an observational thing on our teachers. I absolutely am, and that is very clear through looking through what the documents are, what the process is that they're going to do. I still have strong concerns about analyzing our system right now because our system is operating under a crisis and our, our um, you know, and, it, and it's become where this is where our focus has to be is how do we get through today how do we get through um, keeping our kids safe and our and teaching? And then, so then to try to stretch our brains into what we typically do uh, is, is challenging. And so I, I just, you know, I'm just putting it out there that that is one of my biggest worries. I, I'm not, I'm also not trying to be 
um, an isolationist exclusionist to say that, well, it's not a Vermont company, they don't know. Um, I do have concerns that we get input from um, a potential organization that doesn't understand Vermont. And I realize systems are systems, they should work. But it, it worries me that um, we have out some external information coming through that might not understand potentially the processes, systems, and features we've created that um, make sense for Vermont and that are uh, we are potentially not able to ask the questions in the way that we would. So I, I just feel that I need to be upfront about that. And that those are where my heavy duty concerns are for this. So, so I can, uh, Diane, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, I, I think hopefully what I can tell you though is after you know, what, you're, what I'm gonna tell you is, is uh, this group, uh, their purpose is to make sure they work with the local uh, school district, right? So their their purpose is to make sure we maintain our local control. They they respect the local procedures and processes. If you turn to page uh, 44 and uh, 45, you know th th they're they're supposed to be working within our um, of our board packet. They're supposed to be working within our paradigm, right? Of uh, how we do our business. So when you look at uh, the standard documents that they're going to be looking at, uh, looking at salary schedules, teacher evaluations, planning documents, list of committees, improvement plans. Those those aren't anything that is not, a lot of these things are public already, right? Uh, so I, I, bond sale documents, going to all curriculum guides. I, I, I don't think they're going to be uh, basically uh, telling, uh, telling us, you know, you have to do it a different way than the Vermont way or the Washington Central way. What they, their purpose is to come in and say, this is the Washington Central way, this is the Vermont way, and how can we help you strengthen those, those two with uh, certain, certain procedures and certain aspects that we may, may not even be aware of. So I don't think it's about uh, replacing anything or uh, telling us, you know, take your Washington Central way, all the work, and push it aside. I don't believe that would be the intention. And, and uh, when I, what I know about this company is that they go in all across different places, all across the state, all, all, all different states. And they, uh, according to our reference checks that we did uh, across different states, different states, uh, talking to different folks, they said that uh, they work trying to, they try to work with the local leadership and the boards about what you want for your district, but also trying to give you an idea of what you may consider for your district moving forward. Laura. Thank you, Scott. It, so, it, Diane, I, when I when I read the and I don't want to address it just to you, but when I when I read all the things that they they were they were doing, to me it felt like you know yes, there's a concern that we have to center around COVID, but I the COVID, but I also feel like the kids don't have a year to lose, and this gives us something to look forward uh, to. So, like we're so immersed on on that work, and we. As a, as a board between the quality committee, finance committee, and you know everybody and all of you, we're really we have set all these goals for uh, you know achievement. And so this kind of uh, in my mind gives us something to look forward to that is not COVID uh, related. So that's how I felt about it. And sometimes it's nice to have somebody uh, that diversity of thought from having somebody that has not been doing things in our state is so uh, you know is is, is valuable. To me, I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Flora. Are, are there other board member, Chris McVeigh? Um, in, in terms of the process, Brian, for having the audit done and then the findings presented, um, are the findings coming in the form of recommendations for certain um, changes? They come in, the findings come in, uh, after you do it, they're gonna issue a report uh, to the board, or to me and the board. And uh, the report will issue uh, it, things that we've been working on, think, findings, there'll be findings that uh, they could say uh, based on the five standards. So if you look in, um, if you look throughout the bid, they have the five standards, governance and control, uh, the uh, equity and consistency, assessment feedback, productivity and efficiency, uh, direction, you know, where are, do we have valid objectives for our students with our curriculum? And then they uh, basically will give, give us findings that are 
things that we may want to have additional conversations about. So when you get a finding, you know, if they give us a list of 15 findings, I'm just putting that, or maybe more, maybe less, then we sit back down and say, which of these are relevant to what we're trying to do here at Washington Central? Uh, what are something we can do right now? I mean, there's limited resources, right? So we have, uh, um, you know, we just talked about the budget, right? We, we'd love to do a million different things, but we, we have to do what we can, right? And so who, who is the we when you talk about sitting down and having that conversation? So, so that would be that would be the uh, next uh, step in the process. So this this would be the this would be kind of like the launch of a larger strategic planning process. Uh, and I know uh, when we when we talked about uh, you know developing a strategic plan for our district, uh, getting this information right, looking at the entry plan information that's been, we're we're working on, uh, getting uh, put, putting this all together, and then saying what do we want to do over the next three to five years. And that becomes more of a uh, school board, leadership team, uh, community conversation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Dorothy. Um, I am, uh, okay. Uh, I agree uh, with a lot of what Floor said, um, and I especially, believe that it's something we know we need to do and want to do and this year we have a, a way to fund it putting it off eliminates that way of funding it so i i really think it's crucial that we do that this year thank you dorothy um are there other board members uh jaya I'm just curious, I don't know, Brian, if you've talked to some of the other superintendents from schools where they have gone through this process and what their, um, you know, input is, reaction, if, it, if they find, found it was beneficial or suggestions they might have. Because I see that long list of all the other schools that they've worked with yeah. around the country. Yeah, so uh, I have uh, reference checks in here in front of me. And I can just read you what some of uh, what some of the different districts did uh, talk about. So uh, one district uh, did say that uh, they have used this uh, they have used this uh, company on a number of projects. Uh, they have uh, it's helped them uh, de design and align their ELA curriculum and developing a curriculum de or designing process to address higher order thinking skills. Uh, that was one thing. Uh, they've uh, their one one district said they're still working with them uh, with this. Uh, group around uh, looking at student work, uh, developing policies and practices and procedures. Uh, they reviewed policies, practices, and procedures that were in place for many number of years and were able to make decisions uh, regarding uh, their current policies, practices, and procedures to either strengthen them or uh, reinvigorate what they were already intended to do. Um, their, their curriculum is now better aligned with uh, standards and they believe that they're more in depth than previous. I mean, there's a lot I could keep going, but it, I, I got glowing references from uh, from the three different districts. Thank you. That was a great question, uh, Jonas. Uh, I wonder. Um, I wonder if we could hear from you know the director of curriculum um, about her thoughts about this about a curriculum review. Would that be out of line? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Sure. So I think that we have, um, well, since at least 2010, embraced the opportunity, sometimes with some nervousness, but mostly embraced the opportunity to look at our practices and, um, and, and re review the results in the spirit of continuous improvement. And I think we've made some um, remarkable growth over the years as a result of having done that examination. Um, Diane, I'm, I'm with you in terms of sort of feeling like I'm constantly, there's a, there's a tension, especially this year with like what we're currently facing and sort of that longer term work. And I think that, um, that the polarity there has to exist in tension. And I think that, um, 
I know that this year is not typical. And I also know that this work will really inform the work of our district for a long time. I think we're at a really um, pivotal moment. Um, and I honestly, quite frankly, think that most of the, um, the heavy lifting is going to come to me and to others at central office, right? I, I am really in, I think it's incumbent upon us to roll this out in a way that informs the work and does not overwhelm anyone, any teacher, especially in the system. Um, and so I, you know, that, that's, those are my thoughts right now. I, feel like um, between sort of COVID and consolidation and the timing of the last implementation report that, that this will uh, inform the next three to five years for us in a way that I am really hopeful is gonna serve our students well. Many thanks, Jen. Um, uh, Diane. I, you know, I just, I wanna, make sure that it's not, I'm not thinking that we don't need to reflect and be critical about our practices and change that. I also do want to be mindful that what, whatever plan we make coming from this is a, a long-term plan because it, we're not going to be served if we burn out all of our central office people either. And, and the, the care and the energy that's coming from central office and administration right now is uh, running on empty. And I just wanna be sure that we as a board know that if we're signing on to this, we're also signing on to providing that support in whatever we can, way we can. Ryan. And, uh, and Diane, I, I, and I think that's a, a big part of, you know, central office burnout, uh, leadership team burnout. Uh, the, I, I always ask the question, when, since I've started as your superintendent, is I always ask, uh, is our central office doing what we want it to do, right? And I, and you know, I'm the I'm the new guy, so I have to, I have some fresh eyes. Uh, is it doing what we want it to do? Are we getting the results we wanted to uh, want to achieve for our students? And I think this curriculum review will be a go a long way in telling us uh, where we're at because there might. Be some, I mean, I have to say, I, I've been here only for uh, less than uh, six months and of the people in central office are working around the clock. And I think they were working around the clock before COVID. Uh, and so, so, I, and I, so I, I just know that, you know, and I don't want to pick on Jen, but Jen does five different other jobs on top of her director of curriculum job. So, and you know, it's probably a good idea to look at our entire system and see what we can do to make folks like Jen more effective and efficient in getting into uh, that curriculum piece that, we've been talking about. And we had a good ed quality meeting today talking about transferable skills in the work. And part of it might be how can, how can we accelerate that work uh, if certain folks are not, don't have uh, five different tasks to do in addition to, to that work. So. Thanks, Brian. Okay, have we, um, have we heard enough? Have we learned enough to be able to um, vote um, knowledgeably on this issue? Yeah? Okay. So all in favor of Floor's motion to approve the bid um, as moved and Kari seconded, please check yes. Opposed? Okay. Chris, uh, Chris McVeigh? Or, or yeah, you, I, I, uh, checked, I checked yes. You checked yes. Okay, great, great, wonderful. Um, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. And I think that allows us, unless, um, unless there's something else going on that I have missed, can proceed to the consent agenda, the minutes of November 18, on page 52, would anyone like to move to a preference? So moved. Chris moved. I'll second. Second. Lynn, Chris moves, Lindy seconds. Thank you. Um, are there any changes for Lisa? Okay to you? Wonderful. Okay. 
All in favor of approving the minutes of November 18, as moved by Chris and seconded by Lindy, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And I'm seeing once again, uh, yeah, so the motion carries unanimously, minutes are, um, once again, word orders. And I have the very center of my screen where Lindy's square is outlined yellow. Um, Just have to get us. unmuted from one screen to the other screen. Um, <laughs> I make a motion to accept the uh, board order in the three amounts of, whoa, the first one scared me, um, 1 million. $117,434.66. The second one is $19,327.24. The third one is $58,869.48. Thank you very much, Lindy. So Lindy, Lindy moves. Sorry, can you say the first one again? Sorry, thank you. Great. Sure. One million one hundred seventeen thousand four hundred thirty-four dollars sixty-six cents. Seventeen or seventy? Seventeen. Okay, thank you. I knew I slurred that. <laughs> it's okay, Lindy. It's fine. Um, do we have a second? Second. Okay, I'll Diane. Um, seconds, thank you. So are there any questions about the board order? Very good. Then all in favor of the board of approving the board orders is moved by seconded by Diane. Please click yes. Opposed, click no. And again, I'm I'm seeing all yeses. So the board orders carry unanimously. Um, just remind, um, I know Fleur is usually the one who does this, who sort of reminds us all to send the email view of our signature, um, but uh, please to do that by tomorrow at the latest. Um, and now uh, we go to page 57, central office job descriptions, um, an item that um, you may recall the history of why this is on the consent agenda. Um, so do we have uh, a motion to approve these job descriptions as listed? On block, I guess. So move. Chris moves. Do we have a second? Second. Jonas seconds. Thank you very much. Um, discussion. No discussion. Okay. Um, for my, if I may speak as a board member, uh, I now understand and appreciate why um, the board is actually voting on this uh, after having had discussions with members of the public who um, who feel that who feel that we have too many administrators perhaps so um, anyway uh, if there's no discussion shall we move to a vote all in favor of approving the central office job descriptions as moved by Chris and seconded by Jonas please click yes. And if you're opposed, please click no. Very good. Job descriptions carry unanimously. Um, now we come to, oh, Brian, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, see if I could uh, dismiss my uh, my team. Uh, we were, uh, we, we're gonna, I know we have an executive session coming up and it's getting late and they gotta go to work tomorrow. So I was gonna let them go, the principals, uh, you know, Jen and Kelly, if you feel you can feel free to, uh, and and Lori, <laughs> if you if you just dismiss them, it's 
They've been real busy. Absolutely. With our thanks to all. Get a, get a lot of rest. <laughs> That's probably and, and Elizabeth too. And Elizabeth yeah, as Elizabeth. well. Yeah. Wonderful. So um, whoever leaves, have a great evening. Um, so we're now at item six, 6.1, approve new teachers, resignations, retirements, et cetera. Um, page 75. So um, would any make a motion? I will start. Oh, thank you. Um, that's Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, so you move to approve the long-term substitutes for leave, Jenna Dufford and Colleen Dunn. Yeah, I'll second it. Great. And Lindy seconds. Thank you very much. Um, any discussion? I'm. I, I, if I may just express my um, my delight that Colleen Dunn is returning as a long-term sub, um, and I will renew my um, oft-expressed hope that she will get U32's Latin program up on its feet. Yeah. Here, 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 here. Thanks. Um, all in favor of the motion to approve long-term substitutes for leave, Jenna Duffer, done, as moved by Dorothy, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And we have all yes. Um, the motion carries unanimously and we're happy to have them. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm not mistaken, this brings us to public comments. Um, do we have members of the public who would like to make a comment um, uh, who may have been able to cogitate? Um, yes, Georgia. Hi, uh, thank you for letting me speak. Um, so I'm Georgia Roy. I teach uh, middle school math at U32. Um, so this year I'm just teaching seventh grade. Um, so I was told by um, some members of my union that it might be helpful for me to come to this meeting and kind of just share out some things to the school board um, so that because you might not know of some things that might be going on and um, I felt like it, it was valuable to share out. Um, so I wrote down a few things so I don't get off track. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of share out like the working conditions for um, me and my team right now. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, so we are uh, the seventh grade core called the Earth Core. Um, and we, all of our students are fully in school. We do not have any remote pods. Um, and so, and also just so um, we are, completely different schedule from the eighth to 12th grade in the, um, in the AU32. Um, and we're also unique from the other seventh grade team. So there are two seventh grade um, teams um, because the, seventh, the other seventh grade team does have one remote pod and we have no remote pods. Um, so before I, I wanted to kind of just give you a little bit of like background of what, you know, my like school day looks like, but I just wanted to, um, frame this that I, you know, uh, I want to frame this that like this is what we've been doing our very best um, and we do believe that we have been, um, you know, serving our students um, to the best ability that we can with all these changes. Um, and as a result, our contracts have been in direct violation since the beginning of the school year. Um, so, some things that have been so amazing that um, like this school board has put in place was the half day Wednesdays, which have been so vital like today was so important for us to have that time to meet um, and best serve our students. Um, so also uh, we have been given some, this is the amount of time we're, we've been putting in. So we have been, our administration has given us, uh, uh, us some time. So every other Friday for a few times have given us 
um, our, uh, our full 60 minute duty band um, so that we could meet um, and you know have that extra time. Um, so I just want to say there, there have been really great action steps that um, have has made our jobs um, manageable so that we can best serve our students. Um, but I still wanted to kind of, I'm not going to go minute by minute of my day, but I'm just going to kind of like give you a general overview of what it looks like. Um, so my day does start with TA in the morning. And then right after that, I have my planning period from 8.15 to 9.10. So it's a 55 minute planning period. And then on some days until 2.40, by the time the last, you know, seventh grade students leave my class, I am on 100% of that time. Um, and that does not include my duty-free 30-minute lunch on our, on our full school days, you know, not the half-day Wednesdays. Um, some of those days we do split up um, some of our time. We have a recess for 20 minutes and our team has deemed that it was safe um, so that we don't have to have all of our team re uh, monitoring recess. So some of those times we do have 20 minutes um, to kind of you know, take care of ourselves and, you know, eat if we haven't um, done before, but other days we have zero time um, from the beginning of that day to the end. Um, so duty-free lunch, lunch is clearly in our contract. So 9.3 teachers shall, this is the from our contract, teachers shall have a duty-free lunch period of at least 30 minutes. Um, so I just wanna tell you what our duty, or our 20 minute lunch looks like. So we're teaching. We come into uh, whatever class we're teaching next. We pass out paper towels to each student, spray their desks, then we, you know, give them their uh, school lunches, and then we grab our lunches quickly. We'll eat, making sure kids are following COVID protocols, and uh, you know, making sure other general behaviors are fine. Um, and then we pass out a second round of paper towels, spray each kid's desks, and then we dismiss the kids for recess. That is what my lunch looks like every day. And that is not a 30 minute duty free lunch. Um, so what the general thing I'm like kind of referencing right now, which I believe you'll be talking about in your um, session next is uh, the MOU grievance um, that was, uh, I think, I'm not sure what the right word is ratified um, a, uh, last week, um, but I, and I, uh, so the, while that, that MOU does address some of the issues of working extensive minutes beyond our contract for duty, that was, you know, for seventh through 12th grade, um, this does not address the amount of duty this specific team has been working all year. Um, in my opinion, it does not address that we have been taken advantage of. And now we've set the precedent that we can be wildly taken advantage of for a third of the year with zero consequence. Um, it does not address that the schedule that we have the luxury to um, choose, the seventh grade schedule is completely different from the rest of the school year. We chose that for the best, like, uh, so that we could have the best schedule for our kids. So age appropriate for seventh graders, you know, embedded breaks and recess, that, um, for example. Um, and now we're being asked to teach more instructional hours than any other teachers in the school. Um, and it did, so this also does not address the fact that we created this age appropriate schedule over the summer. Um, and we were given this duty assignment a couple of days before school started. Um, and obviously we were gonna do what was best for students. So we wanted to, you know, we were going to do what we needed to do. Um, and lastly, it, it doesn't really address the extreme toll that it has taken on our team, you know, without having that time to breathe every day has been a lot. Um, so I, from this, I just hope that like we're heard um, and I, I hope, I, I'm not sure what will come from this, um, but I just, I felt like that was something that the board needs to hear. So thank you. Thank you very much, Georgia. That, um, that really helps inform our coming discussion. So. Um, you understand, of course, that we can actually respond substantively to you here. Um, are there other members of the public who would like to pick up at the uh, If so, um, could you click the raise hand button? Perhaps. Um, 
give you uh, a moment to find it. <laughs> um, okay, um, I'm not seeing any other members of the public um, who wish to comment. So at this point, we have on our agenda an executive session um, and we have uh, a variety of, of issues, all of which fall under the provisions of Title I, Section 313. Um, so I would be grateful for a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Flora Second. moves. Chris seconds. Um, any discussion? Brian? Uh, yes, I would just like to have legal counsel. I think he's here. Uh, Scott is here and uh, Carla also to be included in the executive session. Okay, Scott Cameron and Carla Messier to join us in the executive session, as well as Brian, of course. <laughs> Not to forget. Um, is Jim still out there somewhere? I am. Hi, how are you? Um, I, 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 uh, I have um, I'm sort of, uh, put together the, uh, the breakout room right now. What would be helpful for me, I know most of you, but it would be helpful if, if you're a board member, please raise your hand. And I'm going to uh, right. Um, but before you put us anywhere, Jim, we have to. So, so uh, maybe before we put up our hands, could I ask for a vote on interpretive session, please? Click yes. And if you're click no. And actually, um, these could are the yeses. Good enough for you, Jim, to uh, yes, that's to terrific. Pull us into... yeah. that's that's terrific. Thank you so much. Great, and of course, and Scott Cameron and Carla Messier as well. Fantastic. Okay, we're almost set here. And um, if anybody leaves us at this point, um, thank you for being with us all this way. And if you know, we will be coming out. Um, Eventually, <laughs> hopefully not too long from now. And so you're welcome, of course, also to stick around. Great, do we have um, pretty much everybody back? If so, the um, uh, to the diehards who have been awaiting this moment, thank you for your patience. Um, we have just a little bit more to, to do then, um, how should we how should we put the motion? Should we do the MOUs all together or do we need to do them separately? I think we could make a motion to accept the MOUs as presented in the packet. As presented in the packet and um, authorize the superintendent to sign? Yes. And authorize the superintendent to sign. Lindy yes. moves. Is there a second? Chris seconds. Very good. Um, all in favor, please click yes on your screen. Participant screen. If you're opposed, click no. I see all yeses. So the motion passes unanimously. Um, I don't believe we have any. Oh, Jonas, yeah. Who seconded that? Um, Chris seconded. Um, so uh, I don't believe there's any further action from our executive session, but we do, I believe, have um, the board reflection. Am I right? Um, I, I can, oh, oh no, we have future agenda items. Do we need to dwell on any of these or add to any of these? If not, we can go to, um, oh, Brian, sorry. Yes. Uh, superintendent evaluation. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good one. <laughs> so a superintendent evaluation is added as a future agenda item. Um, 10. Uh, new 10 is the uh, reflection on board norms. So I'm, I'm guessing that possibly timing is um, 
one that um, <laughs> will come up. Yeah. Uh, any others? Any suggestions on how to make, uh, how to uh, expedite it? Well, I think our timing actually went really well in open session because we were behind and we caught up and actually got ahead. Um, I think there was a lot of, um, um, I don't think there was anything that could have been done differently in executive session. So um, I think I think that is sort of its own piece, but I think in terms of the regular agenda, I think it actually ran um, really well. Thanks for that. Um, general agreement? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I think we just... Jaya. We, um, we always go long in executive session, so giving ourselves a lot more time. I mean, I see on the agenda, agenda it was 30 minutes, so whoever's planning that out. Um, yeah, um, that, that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, any other, any other uh, reflections? If not, do I dare suggest that we adjourn by consensus at 10.51? Yes, please. We have please. Across the... <laughs> Thank you. I, I heard that. <laughs> Thank so, you, Sarlem. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Brian. Yeah, many thanks. Yeah, to thank you for your endurances. Yeah. Thank Good you. Good night, rest, everybody. Good, Good night. night. Thank you. Take Good care. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Jim. Good night, Brian. See you, Carla.